with a, a question. And that question is, what is love? What is love? Several years ago, a group of uh, professionals posed this question to a group of uh, four to eight-year-olds. And uh, the answer they got, as uh, one researcher said, uh, was uh, broader and deeper than anyone could have ever imagined. They were profound. Uh, would anybody like to hear some of these profound responses from four to eight-year-olds? Uh, Chrissy, age six, said, Love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. Terry, age four, said, love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Danny, age seven, said, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure that it tastes okay. Bobby, age five, said, Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas morning if you stop opening presents and listen. That's good. Noel, age seven, said, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. <laughs> Done that one. Karen, age seven, said, when you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down real fast and little stars come out of your eyes. <laughs> it sounds like anime. I don't know. Uh, this was good. Rebecca, age eight, said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love, she said. That's good. And the, we could keep going on and on, but this next one uh, got me. Uh, honestly, this next one got me. Uh, and I, I'll put it on the screen. Jessica, age seven, said, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should, you should say it a lot because people forget. Because people forget. What I want to do today for the, just the next few moments is simply remind you that you are loved. And not in like a human kind of way, but in a cosmic, divine, personal way that only comes from God because he himself is love. So today, I want to talk about God's love. And if you take notes, the title of my message today is simply, Dear Beloved. Dear Beloved. Now, one of my favorite questions as a pastor to ask is, is, do you believe God loves you? Do you believe God loves you? Over the years, I've gotten the, the same three or four responses when I ask people. People will say, I don't know. People will say, I hope so. People, some people will say, yes, but I don't feel loved. Ever been there? I don't feel loved. I believe it with my mind. I don't feel it in my heart. And then some people will just flat out say, no, there is no way that God could love me. There is no way that God could look down on all of this and love me. There's no way that God could ever love you. And today, with the help of the Apostle John, the Apostle John is going to say, no, 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 no. You can know today. You can know that you are loved by God. In fact, John writes this book so that you would know, so that we would know. He says in verse 16, he says, we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. So my prayer today is that you would come to know and believe God's love for you. So today I want to talk about God's love. And here in chapter four, uh, the apostle John tells us three things that we should know about God's love. And the first thing is this, if you take notes, John wants believers to know, what he wants them to know about God's love is that God's love is personal. God's love is personal. 
Notice verse 9. John says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Now, this is a big deal because this is what Christmas is all about. When John says, John says God was made manifest God was made manifest among us. This, this is what theologians call the incarnation of Christ. So, so when you strip away like all of the lights and all of the trees and all of the food, all of the parades and presents and pageantry, Christmas is all about one thing, the incarnation of Christ. That God became flesh and dwelt among us. That God put on this, that God put on human flesh, and that God became one of us. You see, the incarnation means a bunch of things. But one of the biggest things that it means is it means that God is able to identify with us. So let me ask you today, what are you going through right now? What are you wrestling with right now? What are you struggling with right now? Whatever it is, whatever it is, God knows. God knows. And it's not just this like omniscient, all knowing, like I know about that. No, it's, it's I've, I've been there. Now that's different, isn't it? I've been there. I mean, just listen to how Hebrews describes this in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize, under the, underline that if you have a Bible, just circle that, highlight, underline, whatever, empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So he knows. He knows, man. He identifies with us. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to be tempted, to be tried, to be tested, to be hurt, to be hated, to be rejected, to be mistreated, to be betrayed. He knows. He knows. And Hebrews says that he empathizes with us. Uh, Recently, I heard a psychologist describe the difference between sympathy and empathy. And, And she says... Sympathy is like seeing someone in a hole, and instead of helping them, you ask them about what it's like to be in the hole. But empathy, she says, is seeing someone in a hole and jumping down in the hole with them and saying, hey, I've been here too. You're not alone. So sympathy is like saying, I'm sorry from a distance, but empathy is saying, I'm I'm with you. I I get you. And that's the incarnation. That Jesus got down into the hole of humanity with us. He got down into the hole with you. So I, I, I don't know what kind of hole you're in right now. I don't know how big it is. I don't know how wide it is. I don't know how deep it is, but I can tell you this, that you're not alone. You're not alone. Because of the incarnation, you go from being all alone to being fully known. And, and not just like known like you're known on social media, right? Like we, we all know that's not real, right? Not, not just like known like people know you in the office, like, anybody ever, like, do you realize, have you lived long enough that, like, we just, when we go to work, we go to the office, we, like, we have our work self, but then when we go home and we take all, we take all the clothes off and we still, like, we have our real self, you know what I'm talking Anybody? Like, right? Like, you have your real self. Like, I got my, my work life and then I've got my real, my real life over here. And, and what I guess what I'm trying to say is that 
because of the incarnation, because Jesus came, because he identified, he knows the real you. You are fully known. No filters. And it doesn't scare him. Because of the incarnation, friends, Jesus identifies with you. Personally. Why? Because God's love is personal. That's the first thing that John wants us to know. The second thing that John wants to know is is what God's love is not. The second thing that we see here is that God's love is not transactional. Notice verse 10. John says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Okay, so when it comes to love, who went first? Who loved first? Read it again. In this is love, okay, what, okay what's love? It's, it's this, what, whatever it is, it's this. Okay, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. So who loved first? God did. Who went first? God did. So here, John is saying that God loved us before we loved him. And not because we love him. Like, God doesn't love like we love. You ever notice that? So I've been married for over a decade. I've known my wife for almost 15 years now. And I, I love her with all of my stinking heart. But, and yet, I still find myself doing things, nice things, kind things, loving things, in order to get something in return, to get some attention. Babe, look at me. I'm over here. Can you see that? To get some attention, to get some, to get some affirmation, to get some attaboys out of it, right? To get some affection. So it's, it's at times transactional. And, and we all do this, don't we? Someone gives you a gift, you're like, oh, I got to give them a gift. And it can't be lesser than the gift that they gave me. You ever, right? Someone takes you to dinner. Like, they took you to a nice steakhouse. You're like, I can't get the McDonald's. Like, you know, like, it's got to be equal or greater than, right? And here's the thing. We all do this, but, but God's love is not like that. Why? Be- because God doesn't need anything. So when he loves, his love is perfect. And his perfect love is always out of a out of, out of an overflow, not out of a, a need to be met. And the truth is, man, even think about this. Even if this was a transaction, we would all be up a creek. You know what I'm saying? Like if this was based on reciprocity, like we would all be way up a creek without a paddle. Why? Because we have nothing to transact. We have nothing to, to give, right? And we, the, the Bible would say that we, we just don't naturally love God. In fact, we do the opposite. We rebel. And Jeremiah says that our heart is filthy and wicked. Isaiah says that we have turned away from God, not to God. Romans says that we did not honor God. We did not worship him. We worshiped the created things instead of the creator God. We traded the truth for a lie. That's how we treated God. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that, that we were an enemy to him, that we were God's enemy. And then he says in chapter 2 as well that, that we were dead in our sins before Christ. Now, think about that. How many of you have ever been to a funeral? Okay. Let me ask you a question. What did the dead guy give you at the funeral? Nothing. Why? Because he's dead. And that's us. So the Bible is clear. We don't even have anything to give if this was transaction. I love what Pastor Paul Washer said one time. He said, the truth is, I haven't given God anything in my life 
but countless reasons to not love me. He continues, and yet none of them changed his mind and stopped him from loving me. Why? Because God's love is not transactional. Praise God. So the question is, like, how is this possible? Like, how could God love this way? How could God look at me? I won't point the finger at you. I'll point it. How could God look at all of this? How could God look at us and love us this way? That leads us to point number three. John wants us to know that the way that God loves us this way, why he can't, is because God's love is unconditional. God's love is unconditional. He, John tells us in verse 10, man, just look back at verse 10. John says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you have a pen or a pencil or a highlighter, or maybe just need to prick your finger with blood, underline the word propitiation. The key word here is propitiation. And this is so important. This is so important. Propitiation. I know it's a big word, okay? But if you can if you can order at Starbucks, you can learn the word propitiation, okay? Propitiation means a a payment that satisfies. A, a payment that satisfies. That when Jesus died on the cross, that it, it counted for you. It counted for me. So, so Christmas, why did Jesus come? Good Friday, why did Jesus die? Easter, why did Jesus rise? Why? To make, to, to be the payment that satisfies. To be the propitiation for our sins. Notice he doesn't say mistakes or oopsies or whoopsies. Our sins. Our sins. And, and here's why that's so important for daily life. Like, how does this apply to my daily life? Bryson, tomorrow's Monday. How does this apply? Here's how it applies to your daily life. This means that God can never be dissatisfied with you. Because honestly, what do you think about when you think about what God thinks of you? You know what most of us think? Most of us think that God is dissatisfied. Most of us think that, you know, yeah, you know, we're trying really hard. But at the end of the day, when God looks down out of his heavens and down onto us every day, especially on the weekends, he thinks, oh, like, really? Like, seriously? Like, how much longer do I have to put up with this? And we think that God is really dissatisfied with us. And we think that one day when we die and go to heaven, well, yeah, he's got to kind of take us in because of, you know, the whole Jesus and the cross thing. But when he lets us in, he's going to look at us and he's just kind of, he's going to kind of tilt his head. Well, Jesus did the thing, so you're in, I guess. And he's just going to, he's going to like send us off to like the, the car wash to be kind of power washed of all the grime that's on us. And he's going to put some white clothes on us and send us in. And that is a total misunderstanding of the gospel. Because Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. Because Jesus is the payment that satisfies. God cannot be dissatisfied with you. God cannot be disappointed in you. So not only did Jesus take the payment, but we get the credit. We get the credit of righteousness that God that God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we would get the righteousness of God. That when God looks at you, friend, he doesn't see your sin. He sees his son. 
That's what propitiation means. So when you think about what God thinks of you, you need to know today that when you wake up in the morning, God looks at you and he delights in you. He is proud of you. He loves you. Like today, he loves you. And not like this future version of you. You know, the one where you finally got your act together. You stopped doing all those things that you said you would do. No, today, 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 friends, today, he loves you. He loves you. In fact, this is mind-blowing. I've been saying it for the past four years since we've been open. Now I'm waiting on someone to finally believe it. But that God loves you the same today as he will on your first day in heaven. God loves you the same today, right now, as he will on your first day in, in heaven. And there's nothing you can do to increase his love. There's nothing you can do to decrease it. Like doing better is not just going to increase it, and sinning more is not going to decrease it. Why? Because his love is unconditional love. And why is it unconditional love? Because God in his love sent his son to be our propitiation, a payment that satisfies so that when he looks at you, he doesn't see your sin, he sees his son. And here's the thing, his son is perfect. His son is holy. His son is righteous. Uh, I kind of have this picture, it's not my notes, so this is for you, if it sucks, whatever. Um, I have this picture in, in, in my mind that we wear kind of like a, a chalkboard necklace that just has all these labels of what we think about ourselves and, and how other people perceive us, how other people see us. And, and, and maybe for you it's a sinner, dirty, ashamed, whatever, or proud or you know, awesome or insecure, whatever it is. And we, like, we sit down at a table with God and we've got this thing on and we're like, oh my gosh, this is how he sees me. He sees me as all these things. And what propitiation means, what I've been talking about this whole time, is that God, he, 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 he takes like a giant eraser and he just erases every label that you have ever put on yourself and that anyone has ever put on you. He erases it and he doesn't just like make a blank slate because we don't need a blank slate. He then takes the marker. He writes all the attributes of his son on you. You are holy. You are blameless. You are righteous. You are pure. Come on, anybody. Isn't that good news? That is propitiation. How good is God's love, friends? I mean, he came for us. He, he made a way for us. He paid a way for us. So, what is our rightful response to that? Like, what do we walk away with today? Here is what you walk away with today. It's real simple. Two words. Be loved. That's it. Be loved by God. That is what Christmas is all about. Now, what is Christmas all about? Christmas is all about the reality that God came for us, that God made a way for us and paid a way for us to be loved, to be loved. Remember what little Jessica said earlier? She said, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say a lot because people forget. So listen, I came here today simply to tell somebody somewhere in this room, to tell somebody, to remind somebody that, that God loves you. He really, really does. And he really, really means it. So today, may we come to know and believe the love God has for us and be loved. Merry Christmas.